we're going to record Paige. And today's speaker is Paige Buckingham, and she's going to talk to us about executive function and AAC. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing, and Paige, we're going to hand it off to you. You can tell people what uh, if anything you want them to know about yourself as you get started. Uh, Paige, you're muted. Well, that would be more successful if I did that. This is okay. much better. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to talk about executive functioning skills and AAC today. And um, as Gail said, my name is Paige Buckingham, and I am a speech pathologist by training. I retired at the end of this past school year and now have my own educational PD consulting business um, called Buckingham Educational Services and Training, which... I didn't stop and think about how long that was when I named it that, but my husband's like, hey, use the acronym BEST. So I came up with things. So um, my email address is listed on here and also my website. And I'm gonna jump to the website here in just a second and show you some things. Um, you are going to have access to the training resources for today. So there's gonna be a number of things we talk about and I'm gonna show you and they are all, um, Chandra, could you drop pbuckingham.com in the chat box for people. Um, to Already to, done. You are fabulous. See, I'm just going to trust that you're doing all those amazing things. Okay, so this is the website. Um, if you go to resources and you go to training handouts for AAC, oops, let's see, it is going to ask you for a password and the password is DAISY with all lower cases. So um, put that in and I just wanna show you a few things on that site that you're going to have access to. So you will have access to all of this. You're going to have the slides from the training, um, a tool that we're gonna talk about called the Bees Planning Tool, which is based on the set, um, an executive functioning checklist, dateline or baseline, um, the slides, notes. So when I do notes, I go in and take out pictures and all the extra stuff that you don't have. So you don't have a 55 page, um, thing, uh, communication matrix link so that you could do the communication matrix, um, some different things on executive functioning. I do want to show you this one because I'm going to show it to you in the training and you're going to go, Paige, we can't read that. It's way too small. And I know, but this is how you could get it. So you could look at it later. So this is a website that you're gonna see this. And again, I know you can't read that. You go into it, put in your email address and I would have given you the PDF, but then that takes away from the company who created it to know who's downloading it. So here's the um, link to it so you can get it for yourself. So I just wanted to show that to you. So when I show you in the training, you're not going, I can't read that, which again, I know. Um, so financial disclosures, like I said, I. Um, own my, uh, my, an educational consulting business. And I do a lot of work with Infinitech, which is an assistive technology group based out of Illinois, but we also do work in Kansas and Minnesota. And then I'm also a preferred presenter for text help Don Johnston. And um, I volunteer with CASA. I don't know if you all know what CASA is, but it's court appointed special advocate. So I am fortunate to be a CASA volunteer and I'm a member of ASHA. So again, here's just a little information about me. This is my family. We're getting ready to add another. I'm getting ready to have a daughter-in-law. Um, so that is my family. My daughter is in the middle. And then my husband of almost 32 years, our son-in-law and our son. And I have had the opportunity of living in different states um, in my professional career. I lived in Texas. I went to Baylor University. And then I lived in Houston and worked in the Houston School District, which is a huge, large urban school district. That was my first job. And I actually worked at a school for the deaf, a regional school for the deaf. And then I moved from there straight to Nebraska, to rural Nebraska. So I've worked in urban, I've worked in rural, and then I finished my career in Lawrence, Kansas, which is where I live now. Um, and we are the home of the University of Kansas, although I did not go there. And um, so that's kind of what my trajectory has been. 
Um, as we're talking about today, the objectives really of what we're going to do in this training and in this um, session is you understanding what executive function skills are, and you, you likely already do. And then we're going to look at how do executive function skills in work with AAC? How do those two things connect? And how do you teach those skills? So really what we want to do is looking at how do we support students to be able to learn skills for life? And I always say these are the official ones that we have to turn in for CEUs, but here's what we're really going to do today. I want you to learn something new. I want you to think differently about something you already know. Because, and I just realized that says new instead of no, um, because I'm not going to be telling you anything that you don't already know. I hope I'm just making a link and a connection between two things you know and make you have that aha of like, oh, wow, that's really what I want to happen today. And I just want you to reevaluate what you're doing. Again, I was in education for 32 years. I don't want to add something new to your plate. I don't want to say, and you need to restructure this and create all this. No, no, no. You're going to be doing the same things. You're just going to be looking at it a little bit differently. And that's really what the challenge is, it to, is to expand the learning and maybe make a new friend, you know, connect with somebody that says something and you're like, hey, I need to, you know, connect with them on LinkedIn or something because they said something that really inspired me and made me think about things. And mostly, I want to give you something that the next time you're in the classroom, which for you guys may be later today, that you're going to be able to do something different. I don't want to give you anything that is really difficult. I just want to give you things that you can go, oh, wow, I can kind of do a little tweak on that. So if you could pop in the chat box, who are you guys? I see some PT and SLP after people's names, and I don't know Oregon. So if you tell me where you're from in Oregon, I'm just going to go, great, you're from Oregon. But if you could kind of just tell me, and I see it on the chat box, there we go, um, just kind of what you do, um, what you, kind of what your area is, and kind of what you're bringing to the table today. And when I do in-person trainings, I do people raising their hands, you know, who's elementary, who's early childhood, who's SLP, OT. Um, okay, so we have some SLPs, OTs. Great. So one of the things I did in... Um, my former position is I was a special education facilitator. So I oversaw all of our related services. So I, you know, related services, that's where, that's where my heart is. In fact, right after this, I am heading to the school district I worked in has a triathlon for the students who have severe um, multiple disabilities and everything. And it is the best event of the school year. So as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to be rushing over there to be able to see the end of that. Oh, great. Autism, AT, school-based. Excellent. Akota, great. Excellent. So we have a lot of variety of different um, things in different areas that people are bringing to the table. So again, as Gail said, jump in and talk. This is going to be structured a little bit differently where we're going to, um, I'm going to give you some content and then we're going to kind of work through some things together towards the end. But if at any time you have questions, throw them in the chat box. Gail is going to monitor that for me. Or if you want to unmute and ask a question, please, please, please do, because that's how we learn this. Again, nothing I'm telling you is new. It's all going to be stuff that you're going to be like, yeah, I kind of already know that. I just want you to kind of put a different lens on it. So as we do this, I think it's really important that we talk about presuming competence. And um, Trisha Johnson, who is with Building Wings that used to be with Don Johnston, um, had this recently. She had it on LinkedIn, and I was like, I'm using that is that presuming competence is the belief that all students can learn, though in different ways, at different times, and with learning styles that best suits them. And that's really what we want to focus on. When we talk about presuming competence, it doesn't mean that we're going high end, you can do everything all the time. It's looking at where the student is and how can we make that and assume that anything that they tell us, decisions that they make, that that is really what they mean and not putting a judgment on things. Um, so when we're looking at executive functioning skills, it's not an educational based things. Executive functioning skills initially came from the neuroscience world. And it's um, 
the brain-based skills that are required for humans to perform and execute tasks. So you guys do that all day long. You guys have already done that multiple times today in figuring out um, what time you needed to get up to, you know, do this. If you're like me, I had to figure out how much time do I need to do my hair? You know, how long is it going to take it to dry on its own? You know, all these different things. We do these things all day long, every day. And when we do Fine executive functioning skills, we are really looking at that conscious control of what we think and do and say, okay? It enables us to self-regulate things, self-regulate our emotions, our actions to go, wow, that really made me mad, but you know what? I'm not going to jump across and, you know, yell at somebody. I'm not going to attack them. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go, mm, that made me mad, but this kind of thing. It allows us to coordinate our goal setting and make a plan to how to do that goal. And that goal could just be, I'm going to get to work on time, you know, or I'm going to get my coffee made or my lunch made before I go to bed so that my morning is, you know, smoother. So the goal doesn't have to be some huge, big thing. It can sometimes just be something small. It also allows us to control our attention and focus and to think in a flexible manner. And that's really something that we are seeing more and more kids have difficulties with. So if you guys are like people in other states that I've talked to, and I'm assuming it's not significantly different in Oregon, you're seeing difficulty and issues with executive function skills with kids across the board. Would that be a safe thing to say. I'm seeing some nods of the head. Okay. And that's what I'm hearing. I did some training last month in Illinois and I have done some different things in um, Wisconsin and everything. And that's what everybody is saying is we are seeing this deficit across the board kids with disabilities and without. So when we're thinking about executive functioning skills, um, oops, that's not what I want. I want you to think of it in terms of this. This is from Russell Barkley. And he says that there's really four things that we're working on when we're doing executive function skills, when we're making something happen. There's volition. And I'm gonna put this in terms of raking leaves. And the reason is because when I first did this, I have this big tree outside the window. I'm facing a window right now and the leaves were coming off. And I'm like, ooh, you kind of have to do that for raking leaves. So volition is using your will. Okay, me going, I need to rake my leaves. Then I have to have a schema, so that's a big speech pathology word, or plan to rake my leaves, okay? I have to know to rake my leaves, I'm going to need a rake, I'm going to need a bag, I'm going to need some Advil for after I rake my leaves. You know, I, I have to have a plan in place. I can't just walk out with nothing and rake my leaves. Then I have to have purposeful action, and the purposeful action is me actually raking the leaves, okay, me doing that action, and then the effective performance is me continuing that purposeful action. I can't just go out there and do the purposeful action for 30 seconds and end up with effective performance, okay? So what I want you to do real quickly, and we're just going to take a minute, is think of a common task that you do or a student does and break it into these four things. What does volition look like for that? What is the planning? What is the purposeful action and the effective performance? And then if somebody doesn't speak up, I'm going to pick up, pick on one person. So I'm going to give you one minute and I don't have a timer on my screen, but I have it on my watch. Well, I just said it for an hour. So um, obviously that I don't want to do that. So, <laughs> you know, I, I would say it's Monday, but I guess it's Wednesday. So, okay. <laughs> Anybody want to jump in with a common task you did that you were able to break down in this area? Or pop something into the chat. Jandra says dishes. Dishes. Okay. 
dishes. So volition is they need to be done. The planning is what you need to do that. You know, the um, scrub, if anybody hasn't used a scrub daddy, let me tell you, they are worth it. So, you know, you get your things, you do it, but then you have to complete that whole thing. Okay. Anybody else on something? Uh, making a cup of coffee. Making a cup of coffee. Ooh, an IEP meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Getting up to work out. Excellent. So you see how you can take this with just washing hands. Excellent. With just any task and break it down this way. So you can bring this to your students in a way of kind of breaking this up. Again, you're not going to use the word maybe volition, but you're going to say, you know, making, um, you know, coming up with a plan. So one of the things we need to do when we're doing that is create a schema. So I saw this a while back and kind of was like, wow, that's really empower this is really empowering is that when you don't when you have a life without schemas, which means you don't have a plan, that's when you have a breakdown of these things. And I know you have these kids in your life. When they're told they're cl to clean their room, they don't have a method right? You send them to go clean their room. This was my kids. Go clean your room. An hour later, they're just sitting in the middle of their floor because they have no schema. They have no plan. You're asked to get ready for, to, for bed and you don't have a flow chart of what you need to do. You don't need to, you don't know, maybe you need to, you know, you need to take off your clothes. You need to put your pajamas on, but you don't think about, oh, I need to brush my teeth. I need to do this. A student is asked to play a game and then they get frustrated when they have to wait their turn because they don't have that picture in that plan. You start a new job or a student goes to a new school and you don't know what to do or where to go. You know, I know like when I do trainings, there is a little bit of angst of like, well, where am I going to park and where am I going to do this and which door do I go in or when I travel, you know, if it's a new airport, am I going to find this? So when you don't have a schema, but when you have at least a framework, you know, at least the questions to do. So when new experiences are new, you need to know where to start. You need to know what to do. And that's what our students have difficulty doing. So this was my aha moment. What I don't know that all of you heard is that, you know, Gail had talked about how she and I met working on a project together. And um, then she was asking me, you know, what kind of areas I did. And I said, oh, I do AAC and I do executive functioning. And she said, well, have you ever done a training on those two together? And I was like, well, no. And so she said, would, would you? Well, when Gail Bowser asks you to do a training, you go, yeah, I can totally do that. And so I said, yes. And then I had to put it all together. And after about four months, I was thinking, what, what in the world did I say yes to? And then I had this aha moment. And this was my aha moment. I was looking at and working on some different things related to executive functioning skills. And again, I knew I needed to be putting the AAC lens on it. And so when I looked at these principles for executive functioning skills and how we teach executive functioning skills, you're going to see in a minute how they connect to the best practice that we know about AAC. So we know in executive functioning skills, we have to teach the deficit, deficit skill. Executive functioning skills are innate to be able to learn them, but the skills themselves are not innate. And that is evidenced by different cultures have different things and different priorities with executive functioning skills. There are cultures where being on time means two hours late, right? You know, there are, it's, they're different. So the skills themselves are capable of being learned, but based on what you see and how you're taught that, and it's usually through observation and through modeling that you're taught those skills. We also have to consider the developmental level of the individual. When we are really focusing on executive functioning skills, well, one of the later executive functioning skills is metacognition. So we're not going to jump in and teach metacognition to somebody who has a functioning level of maybe a 24-month-old, because that's just not where they are developmentally. We also move from our external supports to our internal. And what that means is putting the structures around somebody or as they learn something so that they can start to learn to internalize that skill and not need people to do that for them. Okay. A perfect example is checklists, right? We put checklists in place. We put visual supports in place. We may put um, strategies in place, social stories. Well, the idea of a social story is to give that outside external structure and then the individual to be able to start using that internally. And maybe they don't need that social story given to them because they have that social story going on in their head. 
Okay. Um, and then we also modify the task to support their capabilities and their structure and their ability for effort. If the student isn't able to put or do something, we're going to modify that so that they are successful. And then we're also going to use the student's desire for control. If the student doesn't want to do something, we can't make them do it. But what we can do is find their desire for control, figure out where that desire for control fits in, and use that. So these are the principles for teaching and improving executive functioning skills. Then, let's see if I can do this. Whoops. There we go. Here are best practices in AAC, and you can see what I did is I lined them up across each other. So best practices in AAC development are we have to teach a system, right? We don't just give a kid a system and there, there you go. We teach it. We model it. We use aided language. We have purposeful why we do something, right? So we're teaching to the deficit skill, okay? If the student doesn't have commenting, we are going to structure commenting. And again, you can go to my website and you have access to all of this. Also, feel free to take a picture or a screenshot of something, okay? If there's something here that you're like, wow, I want to keep that. Consider their developmental level. We look at the functions of language, okay? We don't expect a child who is just learning language to have all this variety of functions of language. They kind of build on each other, right? We're going to get a system and select a system that is gonna go with their developmental level. We're gonna look at core words. What are those core words that are most common for somebody just learning language to do? Then we're gonna move from that external to internal. And again, we're gonna be using visual supports. We're gonna be using color coding, aided language. And not that we pull those things away, but in time by doing that thing, by doing that, the person who uses the system is going to start internalizing this and picking up on this on their own. Okay, when you're doing the color coding, you know, you, most systems now have the yellow being the pronouns, the green being the verbs or the actions. Well, eventually the person is going to in internalize that and know if I'm doing talking about an action, I'm going to go to the green section. If I'm talking about a pronoun or a person, I'm going to go to that yellow section. So they're going to be internalizing that. We're also going to modify the tasks for them. We have some people who are needing the core words. We have a whole new area that is really being talked about in the AAC world, which is GLP or Gestalt language processing. I'm not an expert on it, so I'm not really going to go there. But like I saw the other day that Assistiveware that does ProLoquo is doing a webinar on GLP. So if you have a student who's a Gestalt language processor, what you do for them is going to look different than for somebody else. You're also going to have different systems that are set up. There's a reason why there is not one system that works for every student. And it's because they have different capabilities. They have different efforts. Some kids need that motor planning piece. Some piece, kids need the category um, piece. Some kids, excuse me, need topic pages. And then using students' desire for control is really that piece of following their lead and assigning meaning. I was telling um, Gail that I did a consult last week and we had a young man who um, was doing, we were doing partner assisted scanning with him and he chose that he wanted to do a break and wanted to do music. We're gonna assign meaning to that. We're not gonna say, oh, oh, he really didn't mean to say that. We wouldn't say that to somebody who was neurotypical. If a neurotypical child came up to you and said tree, you wouldn't say to them, yeah, you didn't mean to say that. That was just a mistake. You would go, oh, tree. Oh, did you see a tree? Do you wanna talk about trees? But yet with our kids who use AAC, people will go, oh, that was a mishit. Well, how do we know it was? We're going to assume competence and we're going to assign meaning to that. So that's where that desire for control. How does kind of bringing these two things together, is this making sense for people? Am I like, okay, I'm seeing some head nods. Okay, good. So this isn't, as I put this together, it isn't just me. Oh, good. I like the thumbs up. I, um, when I, when this came together, I emailed Gail and I'm like, Hey, can we meet? I need to kind of talk about this and make sure it's not just me that came up with this. So when we look at executive functioning skills, it is directly related to language ability. 
Now, when I say this, I am going to acknowledge that we have some people who have amazing language abilities who have horrible executive functioning skills. So that's really not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that initial development, those initial stages, stages. which most, Gail, did you? Oh, no, okay. I was nodding. Your, your screen popped green real quick to me. Um, so what we know is in order to develop this, we have to give students the language that, and we have to be purposeful in using that language with the skills so that they have that. The student isn't going to be able to talk about their emotions if they don't have emotions words, right? Um, we also know, especially with our kiddos who use AAC and especially with our students who are on the spectrum, that our receptive is going to be their understanding and as expressive as how they use it. And those don't always match. We sometimes have kids who have significantly high receptive skills and very, very low abilities in expressive. And we also have sometimes kids who are the opposite, who they have a lot that they say and their expressive is really high, but their receptive may not quite be there. So just kind of that acknowledgement of those are going to be different. So one of the things we're going to do today is talk about, I want you to think about what I call the Bs. And this is based on the SET model by Joy Zabala, which is Student Environment Task Tool, which I'm the biggest fan of the SET. The, I, think, I think I'm actually a bigger fan of the SET than Joy was. She one time told me, Paige, I think you love this more than I do. But um, on the website, and I'm sorry, it's allergy season here in Kansas, and I'm I'm feeling it kick in. I don't know how much you guys have allergies in Oregon, but um, so on the website, you will have access to a page that looks like this, and that is what I call the bees planning tool. So the bees is where instead of looking at the student, we're first going to look at the behavior or what is going on with the student that we're like, oh, that's really getting in the way of their learning. So what's that behavior? And then let's link that behavior to an executive functioning skill. So what skill goes with that. And you may have multiple skills that go with it. Um, then what are supports and things in the environment right now that are available to the student that could help and support them? And then what strategy or what we're going to really look at is what's the vocabulary that we want to do to do this. So again, here's the bees tool. And when we're looking at it for AAC, I want you, as I'm going through this today, to have a kid in mind, okay? I want you to bring a kid in mind that uses AAC, all right? And then I want you to think about what is that behavior? What's going on with this kiddo that's maybe getting in the way of them becoming more independent, okay? What is that thing that is really just kind of that, ugh, we need to move past this, and then what executive function skill do you think connects to that? And we're not going to go deep, deep into all the specific executive function skills today because that's a full day training. But I'm going to hit on a few of them. And I encourage you to do research on this. And one of the things with executive functioning skills, I mean, it's not like language where we go, OK, these are your different areas of language and everybody can agree on that. There are up to 33 different executive function skills that you can find in the research and the literature. Um, and so some people will say there's three, some people will say there's a big four, sometimes you hear seven. I like the 11 that are talked about in the book Smart But Scattered, um, because I like the way they're broken out, because it's like with reading, if I said, well, this kid has difficulty in reading, fix it kind of thing. Well, okay, you, I need a lot more. Is it decoding? Is it comprehension? Is it, you know, wh what's the issue? And so that's why I like to look at executive function skills um, with more so that you can really dig in and find that exact, exact one. And then what are those environmental supports that are already in place? Because they're in place. I guarantee you there are many, many things in place. We just need to pop that executive function lens on it and maybe use those things more purposefully. And then what vocabulary words might need to be taught that the student may not have or that you may need to be very purposeful in using to support that? And then how do you share this with other staff and who do you need to bring on board? So you'll see as you go through this, what I have is what do you need to do this? So, you know, kind of what, what's your plan for this? Who do you need to bring on board? Because I know early in my career, something had said, and I just barged into a classroom and I'm like, we're going to do this. And the teacher was like, uh, did you talk to me about that first? So who do you need to bring on board? Okay. And I am going to encourage you 
to bring all your related service providers on board. I cannot say that enough. All the related service providers need to know this and bring them on board because they have a different lens they're going to bring to this. And then how are you going to monitor the prog progress? And one of the things I really love to have teams talk about is what may be an indicator that this isn't working. And I like to have that discussion ahead of time so that if you see it, people aren't pointing fingers. And also, if you see it, you've already said, hey, if we see this, we need to get together again. And we need to look at what's going on, why do we think it's not working, and tweak it. So if you kind of preempt everything by saying, hey, a possible indicator of this not working is the behavior is going to increase and not decrease. Because we always know the behavior is going to go up a little bit, but it's going to increase and it's not going to decrease. Or an indicator of it not working is going to be a total shutdown by the kids. So if we see that happening, then we need to meet and kind of go on with that. Any questions over that before we jump into some of the next stuff? And Gail, am I right that we need to be done at 915? Okay. All right. I just wanted to double check. Any questions over that? You can pop them in the box or unmute. Okay, we're getting ready to get into some stuff where I'm going to require you to help me. Okay, so how many of you are familiar with the communication matrix that Gail helped create? <laughs> okay, so you guys are very familiar with the communication matrix. So I am going to go talk about the communication matrix, and I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm going to take some liberties with kind of how I'm interpreting some things as far as um, kind of pulling some things together and making some links. So just kind of bear with me. So you're familiar with the communication matrix. So we are first going to look at, oops, this section. Okay. This section, which is our zero to 18 month of development. Okay. And when we're looking at this, this is looking at neuro and Gail, neurotypical development that we see of a child eight, zero to 18 months. And we know our kids who are AAC users are not going to develop mental, they are going to be older when they're in this range. Okay. We know that. So as I'm talking about that, I'll talk about neurotypical and then, then our kids. So when we're looking at that zero to 18 month range, these are the kinds of behaviors and things we see. So you can see that these kids are not in concrete communication yet. Okay. We're seeing a lot of, um, we're seeing intentionality, we're, but we're seeing um, body movements, those kinds of things. When we get into the concrete and abstract symbols, which is going to be our 12 to 24 months developmentally, we're seeing some concrete language, um, some concrete symbols come in. Okay, so we're seeing pictures, we're seeing um, signs, we're going to see some printed words, all those kinds of things. And then when we're in that last one of seven, we are in that 24 plus, okay? Now, as I talk about some other things, I'm going to be talking about neurotypical five to 12 year olds, acknowledging the fact that you, they would be well above that the, where they are in the communication matrix, but our kids have to get to that seven in a communication matrix in order to go to that next place. Does that make sense to people? Okay. So as you see, we have that one to four, which is going to be that really early development. We see that five and six in our communication matrix, which is getting that symbolic communication in. And then seven onward is going to be now they have language and they're starting to use it independently. If you have a student that the communication matrix is not appropriate for because they're above that, another option that you could use is the pragmatic profile for people who use AAC. This is free. It's a free download. And again, I'm not giving you the actual download or the actual PDF so that you can go on, put your information in, and those people will know how many people have downloaded it so that they can use that in however format that they use it. So this is another really good one. Okay, this is the, the document that I know you can't see, but again, you can go in and get it if you want it. So again, we're talking neurotypical kiddos right here. We're just going to focus on these first three areas, which the first three areas are infant, toddler, and early um, learning years. Okay, so infant is going to be in that zero to 24, toddlers in that two to 
two to four, and then early learning. So in order for a child in the infant range to have these skills, they are going to be developmentally here, and they're probably going to be in communication matrix one to five, six, kind of in maybe getting in that five, six range, okay? When they're in that range, again, so I'm taking the communication, what we know about communication, and I'm laying on top of it what I just, you know, this stuff from this. So I pulled the information from this document that you can't see super well, okay? So what's going on with them executive function wise is that the planning is going to be them, the executive skill of planning is them pointing, grabbing, acting on their environment. That is how we know that they are developing that skill. Organization looks like them doing some beginning matching skills. Um, colors and shapes and starting to know um, animal noises and those kinds of things. We also see that overgeneralization that they learn all, they learn that a dog has four legs and then you drive someplace and you see a cow and they say dog and it's that overgeneralization, but that's how they're starting to organize. And it's because then we as adults will say, oh no, that's not a dog, that's a cow. Well, that's what we do to our neurotypical kids that now they're starting to organize that. But for our kids who use AAC, we don't do that. Often what times will happen is somebody will say, no, that's not a dog. Oh, they, they hit dog. They shouldn't have hit dog. And they just kind of wipe it off instead of going, oh, what they're doing is that overgeneralization. I need to go, no, that's not a dog. It's a cow, but it has four legs like a dog. So we need to be able to do some modeling. With working memory, we start seeing recall. We start seeing peekaboo, okay? We start seeing kids wanting to play peekaboo, laughing when you do it, um, participating and enjoying familiar rhymes and songs. You might just hear the intonation of things. Um, fill in the blank when pausing for familiar songs. I remember my son was about, oh, maybe not even 18 years old. And somebody had given us this, he's 27, so a cassette tape that had this ABCs and it wasn't the normal ABCs. It was like A is for apple, B is for ball. And it was this song and had a book. And we played that in the car ad nauseum. And he had a book with it. Well, eventually we would say A is for, and we would do that dramatic pause. And he would say his approximation of apple. And we would go, yeah, that's an apple. So we would start doing that and we would start seeing that working memory. Then when kids get into the developmental two to four, again, neurotypical developmental two to four year range of a toddler, we start seeing more and more of the executive function skills clicking in and it's because they have more and more language, right? So this is where they're going to be in that communication matrix level five, six, moving into that seven, because again, the matrix goes to 24 months, which is two years moving into that where they have the concrete symbols that may be some abstract and they're moving into that language. So we see all these executive function skills click in. So we see planning, we see time management. They're starting to have time concepts of yesterday, later, now, tomorrow. And they get those because we're using those with them and they're building on that. Um, they can start and complete tasks and do them for a period of time. They can start organizing categories by patterns. You start seeing kids, you know, take all their animals and put them here and they take all the, you know, the something and put them there. You start seeing them play with shapes and they start putting the circles together and the this together and um, they clean up with assistance with that cleanup song, you know, clean up, clean up, you know, and they go, oh, I need to do this. We see that working memory kick in and we start seeing emotional control kick in because they're starting to be able to label their own emotions and label the other emotions of others. They'll see somebody cry and they'll say sad. Okay. Maybe the person's crying because they're happy, but they start recognizing that in other people and that empathy starts to develop, but they also still have tantrums. <laughs> they have tantrums because they don't know what to do with those feelings and emotions when they have them. So we start seeing that happen with our toddlers. Then we get into, and I know this is a lot of, I'm, you know, throwing a lot at you, but we're going to then take this information and you guys are going to do some stuff with it. So when we get into that developmental five to 12 years, and the reason I stopped at 12, 
12 years is if you have an AAC user who is developmentally 12 years and above, they're probably somebody who's going to be in general education curriculum and you're going to be seeing a lot of these things happening with them anyway, okay? So again, I'm acknowledging the fact that that communication matrix of seven is 24 months and above, but we've got to get our kids into that area in order for all these skills to develop more fully. And again, you can see that planning, it's upping it a little bit more. That time management, they're now starting to be able to estimate time. Okay, how long is that going to take you? They're starting to be able to understand what is five minutes? What is 10 minutes? When I say, hey, we'll have dinner in five minutes, that doesn't mean go start playing a new video game. That means, oh, it's going to happen quickly. Um, they're able to organize things, follow some directions. They're able to be independent with some games and start doing things, collecting information and applying it to a new setting. Hey, if I um, wore my coat, if I wore my jacket yesterday when it was raining and it's raining again today, I should probably wear my jacket. Okay, we start to see those things. And we start seeing them really be able to self-soothe and use their emotions to control um, different things. So I want you guys, and this is where I need you to open up and type in and jump out. What modifications and things do you already see in the environments in the classrooms you work in? What are some modifications, um, strategies, different things that you already see um, this? Okay, um, what... Can somebody clarify PPP AAC? What what is PPP AAC? That was the the assessment tool you showed earlier. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Chunk information, extra processing, visual schedules. Yes. Visual, visual, visual. Excellent. What are some other things you already see in the environment or people doing? Transition warnings. Excellent. Excellent. Sensory supports, yes. Okay, so you got you guys are getting this. You guys are getting where I'm going with this. Quiet spaces, excellent. So these are different modifications that you might see. And again, you guys put these in here. Reducing distractions, visual supports. Oh my gosh, don't take visual supports away from kids. That is one of my biggest pet peeves is when I have somebody say, well, they don't need their visual schedule anymore. They're doing fine. Well, the reason they're doing fine is because they have a visual schedule right now. Maybe it needs to be tweaked or modified, but I guarantee if I took your phone with your calendar away from you for two days, you would have a meltdown, okay? You might be good for the day because you kind of know what's going on, but you're not gonna be good later on. And if you have a super busy day or your day changes, you're gonna struggle. So don't take those away. So all these different things, barriers, using work boxes, chunking things, checklists, re rehearsing expectations, social stories are a great one. So a lot of things that we already do and what we're gonna do is go, let's put an executive function lens on these. Okay, here's a plug for reasons to use visuals. And this is a free download from North Star Paths. If you've never gone to their website, I encourage you to do so. These are free downloads. They have these great visuals, much graphic ability that I do not have. But I love this to be able to share with people who may not fully understand exact, may not fully understand visual supports and why you do them. You know, it, these are things you all know. They're permanent. We can see them. You can't argue with a visual support. All those things. So this is a great visual to give the rationale behind visual supports. These are the executive function skills that I am a proponent of as far as like when I break it up. And this is from the book, Smart But Scattered by Dawson. And I always say gear. I don't know if that's the correct way. I did take French, but it didn't stick. Um, and these are the 11 that they talk about in their book. And I have four of them highlighted because these are like the kind of initial ones that we're going to really focus on today. Okay. Response inhibition, working memory, emotional control, and sustained attention. And while I would love to spend time talking about all 11 of these and getting into them, that, like I said, that's a full day training. So we're going to jump into and really just hit these four today. But I, again, I encourage you to research these other ones, look at them, find articles and information on that. And I'll make sure that on my website, um, 
I do have a list of books on executive functioning skill that I um, share with people. And I don't know that it's linked to the page that you guys have access to. So I'll make sure it's popped in there. So we're going to talk about response inhibition, which is really the granddaddy of all the executive function skills. Because if you don't have the ability to inhibit a response, all the rest of them are going to have difficulties. Okay. So when you have response inhibition, what somebody can do is you can share toys or materials. Okay. You understand you can, it's not just that grabbing. You can wait for a short period of time. You can keep your hands and feet to self. You can do one to three step directions, follow simple classroom rules, calm self when you're upset. So these are some things that we see in the environment that I feel like, and again, if you guys have other ideas or other things, open up, unmute, say them. This, this is the part that is the us really talking about it, okay? So there's not a specific like, now we're going to do this, but this is that time. So these are things that I feel like I have seen in classrooms that support response inhibition. You might see that wait symbol that is used, okay? You might see a stop symbol. We have visual barriers in classrooms where, you know, there's a line drawn around, you know, this is where you go for your workspace. This is where you go for this kind of thing. Um, you see a schedule that's time related. You see visual schedules, you see token boards, first then timers, time timers. What are some other things you see in the environment that you would go, oh, I could say that that works on response inhibition. What are some other things that you see? A reward system. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Anybody else? And again, feel free to unmute. I'd love to hear you. Unmute because it's just too long to type it. <laughs> Yeah, excellent. So, um, one thing that I've seen used is a transition tool. Um, like if a student has a hard time transitioning to their next uh, classroom or they have to leave the classroom to go do their speech services, they, we would do a transition tool or task where I need you to take this to Miss So-and-so and she's going to do this and this and you're going to bring something back for me. So they had a reward of being feeling important or a part of the process. And that was their job. To, they had a job for the transition. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And so many different things. Again, so many different things that we do with kids that it's just best practice and we do them. Again, it's just putting that of that executive function piece on there. Anybody else? I see there's something in the chat box, but Freya says yellow zone choice board. Yeah. yeah. Sensory and supports. Excellent. Oh, gosh, you guys, these are great. Okay, so now I, I, I would love you guys to throw things in the chat box or say these out loud. What core words, and some of you aren't SLPs, but you can put this lens on also. What core words, and core words are those words that can be used in lots of different environments. So if you're not familiar with core words, that's probably something I should add in here. Core words are words like stop, go, wait, look, like, you know, they're not the fringe that is specific just to an activity. So what core words would you focus on to support executive function develop? Break, help, More done, stop, go, again, off, excellent. Wait, great, excellent. All right, so here's some that I've come up with. Similar to what you guys have said, wait. You know, I, 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 if I tell a student they have to wait and I have not spent time teaching them what wait means, I, I don't know that I can expect them to do that. Or at least it may not even be a structured teaching, but just a purposeful use of, okay? You know, oh, I'm going to give you your cup and then I'm going to use my AAC system, wait before I give you some water. Oh, now I'm giving you water. You know, just doing something purposeful like that. Stop, go, first, then more, all done. All those things are gonna be focusing on response inhibition. Again, are these words we use with kids now? Yes, but if you are like me, when I was picking core words and how we're gonna focus on core words, we would maybe do a core word of the month or a core word of the week or three core words of the week. I rarely had a big rhyme or reason between behind choosing those, except that I found them on a website and somebody had already created it, okay? You know, I found it on 
um, you know, AAC core or something like that, which again are fantastic. But if we were really purposeful in picking those words, because again, to my knowledge, and if I'm wrong and somebody knows of this, I don't know that they're hierarchical. I don't think that you have to learn these three core words before you can go to these core words. Again, it's going to be how you embed it. So if we're purposeful in doing that and going, hey, we have a kid that response inhibition is really difficult for them. So therefore, let's put that exec let's put that response inhibition lens on when we're picking our core words. So are we doing something different? No, you're still using the same um, structured stuff, the same evidence-based best practice AAC. You're not changing any of that. You're just being purposeful when you choose those. So now when we jump into working memory, this is the ability to hold that information and use it later. So this develops early in infancy. This is where we do, we hide a toy and put a blanket over it and the kid like goes and looks for it for the first time and everyone goes crazy. Oh, they were looking for it or you hide the toy and they think it's gone you know I know there's the um thing that went around the internet a while years ago where people um would have their dogs and they would stand there and then they would pull a blanket up and then they would jump out of the way and the blanket would drop and the dog would you know do that well a dog doesn't have a working memory like that okay that's that's why the dog would think that they were totally gone is because they don't have the ability to do this and we as in people do. Language, as it develops, you're really going to be able to expand your working memory. This gives you following directions, schedules, keeping track of materials. Imagery is really, really important when it comes to working memory. And that is something a lot of our kids do not have is imagery. And it's when you can put that mental image on something and use it for repeated practice. So Russell Barkley says that imagery is related to repeated practice, self-monitoring, self-stopping, seeing the future, saying the future, feeling the future, playing with the future so that you can um, effectively plan and go forward in the future. Think about your kiddos who use AAC, about the individuals in your life that you know who use AAC, and they may not have imagery because we've really never spent the time working on and teaching them or expecting the competency to be able to do that. Here are some different environmental supports that do work on um, working memory. Visual schedules, absolutely. But again, while we don't wanna take the visual schedule away, we may wanna compact it a little bit. And instead of having a, the task, do this, do this, do this, you know, so um, maybe your task for putting a coat on is put your coat on, zip it up, do this. Well, eventually you may want to shrink that to, get, you know, get ready to go home and you want the person to internalize those different things. Okay. Those different steps. That's the working memory. Social stories do working memories, task boxes, first, then visual supports, um, head to toe, ready to go is one we're going to talk about. Um, it's the head to toe idea from, um, Sarah Ward and block and box, which is this one with this young lady ready to go for class is a strategy from Sarah Ward. Um, again, I'm going to plug Sarah Ward. If you have ever heard Sarah Ward, she, you know, she's amazing when it comes to executive functioning skills. And if you haven't ever heard her, I encourage you to do that. But what the idea with this is, is that all these different areas together is ready to go for school. So I have to get my band stuff together. I have to get my books together. I have to get my technology. And once I have that, I have my big um, box ready to, or I have my big block of ready to go. And then also task analysis activities that we do for kids. Here's the idea of head to toe. I call it head to toe ready to go because it's kind of catchy and people remember it. But here is not ready. Here's this young man, um, not ready. Okay, mom says it's time to go to practice. It's trying to go to flag football practice. And he's like, I'm ready. And she says, uh, no, you're not. So how does he know when he is ready? Well, here he is head to toe, ready to go, where he has from head to toe, his hat, his mouth guard, his flags, his football, all those kinds of things, you take a picture of that and now you show it to him. So you are helping him create the imagery and you say, are you head to toe ready to go? Let's check it off. And you go through the picture and go, do you match the picture? Then he learns to visually do that. And then eventually you later you can just go, hey, are you head to toe ready to go? 
and hope that he or you know and then after a lot of time he's able to do that in his own head but we don't do these things with our kids who use AAC. Think about it. If you were doing a, are you ready to go to lunch? Are you ready to go to here? Take a picture of them ready to go with whatever they need with their communication device with them. A picture with them with their communication device, going to the classroom, you know, holding it. Are you ready to go to class? I have my communication device. I have my, you know, visual schedule. Here's what it looks like. Them holding it, you know, cheese. And then, okay, now are you ready to go to the class? And they're starting to create that imagery. When we're talking about working memory in AAC, again, throw in what are some vocabulary words you would use to support this? Feel free to unmute. I would love to hear voices too. This is called Echo Voices, by the way, I think. <laughs> Oh, I've lost my chat box. You know, for me, the, just the concept of teaching working memory um, for for AAC users is is a little bit different and unique. Um, I think the vocabulary words for me would be pretty unique to whatever it was I wanted them to remember. But the idea of asking one of my students who uses AAC to tell me all the things she needs to get together to take to the lunchroom is um, it's a, just something I never did. We're, we're hurrying and we're trying to get ready to go someplace and and stuff like that. So that I, I just like the idea here. Well, and Gail, I think I, that's important because, oh, sorry, somebody else, please. Um, well, I was just going to um, kind of add on to what um, Gail said was, yeah, I, I love the idea. And so my first word, um, I, you have them right there. First, then, and ready. And, you know, and have taught those words, you know, taught what those words mean or in process of teaching those words. So well, Vicki, are you saying ask students to be able to use them expressively? I mean, we do a lot of receptive no, first then. No, oh. no, receptive receptive that we teach them those words so when we say get ready to go to lunch they do it so it's um basically just just using that get um the get ready to go um verbiage and teach them those verbs or those words so they know what they mean mm -hmm. And I think that's the big thing. We use these. I mean, how many times have I used a first then with a student and I never really spent time teaching them first or then <laughs> or was never purposeful in doing it? I mean, yes, I was modeling it, but did they understand the concept of first? Did they understand the concept of then? Did they understand that first and then there's a wait period? I'll be honest, I don't know. And so I think these are things that we really want to do. You know, when we're doing that working memory, we really want to get into what are those specific things that the student needs in order, again, because that working memory area where this is where we're starting to really build that vocabulary and everything for them to be able to do it and be purposeful and do it again. Don't do something different. Just be kind of more purposeful as you do it. And, and, it's, and it's those things that, you know, we we just throw into a lesson that we just kind of like go, oh, as I'm doing this, I'm going to say this thing and, you know, be a little bit more purposeful in it. So that's the piece on working memory. Now we're going to jump in and I see we have about seven minutes left, so we may not get to the full last one. But again, you guys are getting the idea and concept of this. So emotional control is the ability to manage those emotions. And I think we often think of, especially when it comes to people who have difficulty with emotional control. We think of people who have tantrums or can't control their emotions by doing something that is maybe a disruptive behavior. But I want to challenge you also that is the student who just sits and gives us very little input, do they maybe have some emotional control issues? You know, and maybe their emotional control is they need to learn when they're upset. They need to learn when they're frustrated. They need to learn those words to be able to say, I don't like that, you know, stop. 
Um, but we, we really don't do that. And I saw somebody put in earlier yellow zones of regulation. So these are things we do that are in our environments, using zones of regulation, using first then, and using five point scale, size of the problem, time timer, the super flex materials from Michelle um, Garcia winner are fabulous. Everyday speech mater materials, are any of you familiar with everyday speech? Yeah, it is fantastic. I, My district found it during the pandemic. And if you're not familiar with it, it says speech in it, but it's really a social emotional curriculum. And they have a lot of great videos on YouTube that are free, but then there is a whole curriculum that you can purchase from them. So these different things and using words to really talk about emotional control and be able to name it. So some of those things are, and you guys are already getting my rhythm on here, are what are those words that we need? Um, ooh, gosh, yes. Sorry, I'm seeing one of the comments. Sometimes we expect they just watch others and do it, and it doesn't mean they understand the why. Absolutely. So what are some of the words and everything for emotional control? So some of the different ones I go ahead. No, I <laughs> go ahead. Your turn. Um, so you know, like, don't like, happy, mad, frustrated, yuck. I love teaching kids the word yuck because they kind of a lot of times you'll see that receptive understanding where they're giggle. You know, I think it's important for a student to also learn, I don't want you to do that. Stop. You know, I mean, we need our kids to learn they can say that. Also, actually teaching those emotion words. It's more than happy and sad. We want to teach joy. We want to teach love. We want to teach anger, fear, disgust. And it's so fun to teach these and have kids, if they can, try to make the faces for the word or you make the face and have them try to mirror it and that kind of stuff. Those are super fun ways that you can do that. All right, we're going to jump in. We've just got a few, few more minutes. So sustained attention, I'm going to just spend some time. Again, sustained attention is that being able to maintain that attention for a longer period of time. We're doing the same things. How many, on almost every one of these things, we've said first then. But again, if I'm doing first then for sustained attention, my, how I per, kind of approach that is going to look different than if I'm doing sustained attention for response inhibition. Okay, again, same activity. It's that why behind it that you really want to think about. So some of the words are the more, the stop, again, words we've already talked about, but also this is something I feel really strongly about. I love POD, which is Pragmatic Organizational Dynam Dynamic Display that was created by um, Gail, I want to say Gail Bowser, it wasn't Gail Bowser, by Gail Porter out of Australia. And what it does in there is they have these things called pragmatic branch starters, where you start saying to the student, oh, you, you say, oh, you want to tell me something? It happened. It already happened. It's going to happen in the future. It's happening now. I think those concepts are amazing to teach kids instead of tomorrow and yesterday, because if on Wednesday I say tomorrow, I'm meaning Thursday. But on Thursday, when I say tomorrow, I'm meeting Friday. And that can be really confusing for kids. But if I say it's happening in the future, they know that it hasn't happened yet and it didn't happen behind me, it's still going to happen. So I really like those. And then you can link those other words on there. So that's pod, which is pragmatic organizational dynamic display. So we're, if anybody has kind of come up with something, um, we've got about three minutes here. Um, what are your, as I say, B's, you know, what are the vocabulary words? What is the task? What is the executive functioning skill that you have through this thought of your kiddo and then go, oh, I want to go deeper and investigate that. Well, I, I want to go in more and investigate the ready set go and how to teach those words and the, I thought that's like that's my takeaway from this yeah or yeah. one of one of my takeaways absolutely anybody else uh 
I've been thinking about a, a student that I know and her um, sustained attention. That was like, she's always asking, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? I want it now. I want sure. So there's just no. Um, and I answer her because she's communicating and she's doing it with her device. And that's really lovely. But I've never thought about teaching the skills I would have taught my own children um, who, who didn't have disabilities. You know, like with with my son, we used to say, well, it's going to be two Mr. Rogerses, you know, because he had a sense of how long Mr. Rogers was. And so we did things like that. But so I'm loving the idea of, of sustained attention and wait time. And Gail, really what you say is that, you know, piece that is so important is that, you know, that presumed competency and the putting, what do we do for our neurotypical kids that we yeah. don't do for our kids who use AAC devices and those kinds of things. And, you know, I see so often people discounting, you know, things saying that's a mishit or that's, or this, or that's this. And we would never, ever do that to a child who is a speaking child. And so I think it's really important for us to presume that competency of they meant to say that and then assign meaning to it. And maybe they didn't mean to say it. Maybe they did just hit a button and their finger hit it accidentally. But by us assigning meaning to it, it's going, oh, if I do that, this is the kind of response I get. And I want that, or even just a learning piece of, oh, I've always seen that button there. I didn't know what it meant. And now I know when I hit it, you're going to do this. And now I'm going to use that button more often. Um, so so I, see, uh, I see a comment in the chat, um, which I think is is worth repeating. Or um, We're struggling with new teachers and understanding that teaching and using visual schedules so that kids know what's coming to limit anxiety. I think um, that... We have a lot of new teachers here in Oregon, as I know is true around the country, but it's, um, it seems like this is really valuable information to um, help make sense out of some of the environmental modifications that we, we are doing. Well, and I, I assume you're seeing this the same way we are in Kansas and in other parts of the country. Not only are we seeing a lot of new teachers, we're seeing a lot of teachers who don't come with traditional education backgrounds, right. you know, coming with some other background and getting a waiver or an emergency certification and just kind of jumping in. And yeah, I think those are so important. That's one of the reasons I love that visual from North Star is it's a visual about visuals. And so it's a way you could present something. Sometimes I've even taken that and like printed them out on, um, no, on like a kind of card stock and cut them and done a beginning of the year note to teachers. Hey, I'm so glad I get an opportunity to work with you. And so it's like a postcard. And then on the other side, you know, but always retain the copyright information. Um, you know, on the other side, it has that picture of why visuals are important that you're going to put on it. And, you know, you might even say, hey, this is a really great website. I mean, seriously, they have a ton of posters and everything that are just there for are free and available. So I encourage so you. Paige, to why don't you wrap it up here with your, yep. I assume this is your last slide. This is it. And then we'll stop the recording, but we'll stay on and let people chat more if they want to. Okay. Yeah. So just a reminder, if you have a question or a comment or a thought, feel free to email me. This is my email, pbuckingham.kansas at gmail.com. And then the website. And again, go in and look at those resources. Um, the password is Daisy. And um, I will, as I, new things come up, I'll add them to that page and you will have access to that page. So it isn't a one and done thing. And um, I am on LinkedIn and Twitter. I only, for Twitter, it's only business related. I don't do any other kind of stuff on there. Um, but yeah, I'd love to connect with you guys. And thank you so much for joining today. And uh, email me and let me know what you think. If you use any of this and it's successful or if it's not successful, let me know. Um, you know, that's information I want to know too. So I appreciate your time this morning. <laughs>